Sure. All right, welcome everyone to another monthly meetup of the Financial Freedom to Apartment Investing. We are an affiliate of the GOB Network of Apartment Investors. And on this platform, we educate, we empower, and we connect people to wealth. And today we have two amazing speakers. I typically have one, but I had to bring two for this for this panel. So we have none, none, none other than Angel Williams, who's missing her halo, of course. And we have Mr. Dominic Green. And surprisingly, they're both from Texas and they're both economists or studied economy in school. So we're going to be learning about the current economic climate and its effect on the real estate market and everything else that's happened. And now just a disclosure, these are opinion-based ideals. So please do not take everything as law here and we'll come back and say Mark said. So these are just, I, I don't want to say speculation, but these are, you know, information that we definitely need to consider, especially as investors, we need to take into consideration, in, um, you know, inflation, interest rate, and everything that's happening right now so that we can be savvier and smarter investors in the long term. So without further ado, Dominic Angel, welcome to the platform. Thank you guys for jumping on. Uh, thank you for having me. So okay. the, show's, the, sh <laughs> the show's in your hands, guys. Uh, we were having a definitely a great discussion on quite a few things. Inflation was the first uh, was the first one, and a few other terms you guys were throwing around. Stagflation, never heard of it. Again, I'm not an economist, <laughs> so please uh, enlighten us on on what what. Let's let's continue this amazing conversation on inflation. Um, so I can, I can kind of start. So inflation is just an overall increase in the price level. So prices are going up. What causes inflation? Well, a lot of things can cause inflation. Quantitative easing being one of the biggest <laughs> the reasons. <laughs> um, you put more dollars out there in the money supply and prices are going to go up because people adjust to the fact that there's more money in the dollar supply, like more money in the money supply like fairly quickly. So that's my biggest issue with this incremental increase in interest rates, but I'll let Dominique chime in because otherwise I'll just kind of take over. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. I think, you know, overall, I mean, if, if, if as, as people who are current investing or looking to get into investing, especially in real estate, I mean, you know, or, you, or you, you've heard people talk about the interest rates are going up, right? And so we know that Couple of things. When interest rates going up, real estate is supposed to be a hedge against inflation. So, right, keeps up with it. Um, however, there's a caveat, caveat to that because those that rely more on debt, the cost of borrowing goes up. So, if you're getting into multifamily and or you've already been in multifamily, you know that it's already been highly competitive. Um, everybody's in, in every pension fund or whatever has been allocating more and more of their allocation towards real estate. So you're competing with everybody um, for the same property. Um, and the only thing that kind of makes things pencil now is rent growth, because without that, nothing really pencils, unless your cost of capital is so low, it's so low that it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah, no, and, and the way I explain it to my students is basically as interest rates go up, the cost of holding somebody else's money becomes higher. Because a lot of people don't, I mean, I'm not saying that it's true in the multifamily space or in just real estate investor space in general, but not everybody understands what an interest rate is. And so the way I explain it is that it is the cost of holding somebody else's money. So if you're holding somebody else's money, it becomes more expensive as the interest rate goes up. And as the interest rate continues to go up, it becomes more and more expensive. So that means that if you're going to pay Say you were going to pay $9 million for a property before. And 20% of that's going to be your own money. 30% of that's going to be your own money. 70% of that's going to be borrowed. If the cost of that 70% borrowed goes up, then you can't pay as much for the property for it to still be profitable. So your offer price has to go down in order for it to remain profitable. And for us, we're in that right now. Like we're looking at putting an LOI in today or tomorrow. And we have looked at so many prices, <laughs> like mm -hmm. offer prices. We've looked at, like at first I was like, okay, 
we can offer, I don't know where all this is going out to, but we were like, we can offer <laughs> 90 million or we can offer 90,000 a door. It's like 10, three. Then we found out that the insurance price was going to be going up. Well, that whittled away at that 10, three. Then we discovered that we were going to be looking at a higher floater and our loan people were like, okay, you need to be planning for seven and a quarter, maybe even seven and a half. And all of a sudden this price we thought we could offer is no longer viable because of where the interest rates are going. And if, if that doesn't make sense to you, just look at your grocery bill, which is what Dominique and I were talking about before we really started recording this thing. Like what's your grocery bill doing? Is it sitting the same or is it going up? Yeah. And so what, so I guess the thing would be, okay, so we know the interest rates are going up. What do we do as investors? How are we approaching investments? Well, I think it all starts with the strategy and what is your overall goal? Are you holding this property long-term where, you know, over the long-term, you know, it really doesn't matter per se, right? How much you're paying for it now because your horizon is so much longer. If your horizon is a lot short, shorter where you're doing the value add strategy, you know, you're trying to get in and out within five years, then there's a whole different way that you have to approach, um, you know, you're looking at a property in underwrite. So obviously, a lot of those properties, you're going to have to get some type of bridge debt, which bridge debt is still offering a little bit more um, uh, debt funds than obviously, you know, the, the government or Freddie and Fannie, uh, where they're still probably, I think, what, 60, 65? And I think... Um, we refuse to chase agency at this point. <laughs> and, and bridge debt is still, they've gone down to 70, 75, somewhere in that range, if I remember correctly. But their rates have went up. And then they're also... From well, up, from and you're still there. LTC. Instead of yeah, LTV. So it's still more money. It's still more money. But I think they've also, some of them are being more picky on how much they're, like you have a certain threshold, like it needs to at least be 5 million or something like that, right? Mm, or they need to consider that. Or if, if not higher, right? I think they're not doing the smaller balance loans on those bridge. Oh, hold on. Jason, are they still doing bridge, like the smaller balance loans on the bridge? Oh, so my husband is the underwriter extraordinaire <laughs> and he just said yeah they're still doing small balance but they are expensive they're expensive right yeah because they prefer so they're, they're stepping up those costs they're preferring larger so then obviously they're going to make you get an interest rate cap right so and those are super super expensive, expensive because they know the people who are the providers of these caps know the interest rates are moving right so your caps would used to be let's say maybe a year or so ago we're probably what 30 grandish. Yeah, I've heard 30 to 50. 30 to 50. And now they're probably anywhere from 400 to almost a million dollars, depending on how, how long that strike the, the term is and the strike price that you're getting it on. So what you're seeing the what you're seeing people trying to do um it to kind of reduce that cost is they're trying to have it kind of where it's a step up basis. Uh, so it starts up gradually as a as a lower rate and goes out a uh, higher longer term or they're expanding their strike um cap which is probably you know usually it's two percent but they're probably going out to three to four percent to try to make it a little bit, a little hey, bit we're less. even looking at recourse debt we're like what can we possibly do to decrease that interest rate some so yeah. how can we look at bank debt how can we look at other forms of debt because in my mind this thing is all going to even out in 18 to 24 months and i could be wrong i'm an economist you know on one hand not the other <laughs> um <laughs> But my, I really believe that things are going to even back out in 18 to 24 months. So could we do recourse debt for 18 to 24? We could. And with a recourse debt or with a bank loan, we're looking at a lower interest rate, which makes things a little bit more, more affordable and it makes them look a little prettier. But what happens in 18 to 24 if we can't refinance into something different? And that's what everybody's going to face, right? Well, that's what we're all looking at. That's that uncertainty, right? Because they're going. You think about it. If you haven't been underwriting it for those one plus one plus ones, which you're seeing, seeing a lot of these uh, guys that syndicating deals are doing two one plus one plus ones to reduce mm -hmm. the cost. Obviously, they're already factoring in those uh, the the cost to exercise those those uh, extensions in their budgeting. Or if you haven't, you need to be. Um, and then, like I said earlier. 
the only way that it's kind of still making somewhat sense is that we have rent growth. Because like I said, if we didn't have the rent growth, you wouldn't be able to underwrite any of these deals. And that, Gary, that varies on market to market. So every market is different. Like here in Texas, it ranges anywhere from 15 to 25% if you're in Austin. Um, and I don't know other markets, I don't know where everybody else here is from. Yeah, but I mean, like we were sitting on a call today, literally like two hours ago. And it was me and my husband and other of our GPT members. And it was like, okay, <laughs> where else can we find the income stream? So I'm, I'm texting the broker and I'm like, dude, how many washer dryer hookups are there? He's like, oh, all of them have washer dryer hookups. We don't believe it's actually all. Um, it might be 25 to 50%. <laughs> and so we're like, okay. So what we need to do is we need to contract out with someone that we can rent the washer dryers from and maybe pull a little bit off the top. So there's an income stream. The covered parking, they already have enough for every single unit. Now, where for those of you that don't know, where I live is Tornado Alley. We get huge hailstorms here. And most people that are renting, what is their biggest asset? Their vehicle. So we want to be able to protect their vehicle. Well, at this particular property, there's enough covered parking for every single apartment to have at least one spot of uh, covered parking. So that really can't be another stream. So then it's like, okay, so let's look at Wi-Fi internet. Can we pull something off of that? Can that be an income stream? Well, we don't know if they're doing that already, but that's three. And that's kind of where we top out at. And we're like, man, what else is there? Because if you can't come up with something else, rent bumps, if that, if your only model to increase your NOI is rent bumps. This is, <laughs> we're about to enter a period of time where rent bumps, if that's your only option, you're gonna be hurting. You've got to be able to think of other ways to increase the NOI than just rent bumps. There's gotta be something more. Because at there, there does come a certain level to where people will stop paying a certain amount of rent. So you, yeah. you can't just say, hey, I'm gonna keep increasing rent $300. Because at some point, there's going to come a threshold where people say, you know what, I'm not, I'm just going to go somewhere else. Yeah. And they'll go further out because it just makes more sense from a cost perspective to go further out, maybe drive a little extra, carpool, share, go to live at somebody's house, then to pay that extra $300 increase. Yeah, because they're also going to be looking at, <laughs> or they'll have pitchforks. That is awesome, Dan. <laughs> and the thing is, so like with fuel, fuel is a weird demand curve. So fuel has a kink demand curve. What that means is that there is a specific amount of fuel that everybody needs, at least in the short run. So everybody needs a specific amount of fuel for their day-to-day -day operations, right? And once they have fulfilled that need, then the demand becomes way more elastic. And what that means is that as price increases just a little bit, demand responds a whole lot greater than those increases in price. So if demand is super elastic and the price goes up 10 cents per gallon, then demand is going to drop off substantially. So that's what it means when we say that something has a super elastic effect. So with, a, with that kink demand curve, you've got a specific amount of demand that is relatively inelastic. So regardless of what the price does, at least in the short run, demand isn't going to change a whole lot. But once you get above and beyond, yeah, once you get above and beyond that amount, it could drop off substantially based on price increases. So fuel is one of those weird ones. It's probably the weirdest demand curve you'll ever see. <laughs> it's only the utilities, like I said, your electricity and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter. You still got to pay for it regardless if it goes up. At least in the short run. I mean, in the long run, you're going to figure out ways around it. Because like in the long run, what do you want to do? Generators? <laughs> Well, I'm thinking like even fuel in the long run, what are you going to do? You're going to figure out which friend you're going to ride to work with, right? Or you're going to figure out <laughs> like, can I get a scooter? Can I get a bike? Can I do this? Can I do that? You're going to figure out ways around buying fuel. Yeah. Or, but in the short run. Or with, with well, not because y'all, or with, you know, what's been happening in the office market. So just to give everybody context. So I am uh, a managing partner and a broker. Um, so I help you know, tenants and landlords lease their spaces, as well as people buy commercial property and working on affordable housing. So like what the, the whole office thing is, you know, people going to the hybrid work thing, you're going to have more requests for that. 
to where they're not coming into the office as much. Um, so they can do everything by Zoom because they don't want to travel or they're going to pay them. More. And we already know still wages are still lagging from where, because what was inflation around 8% roughly? I think you're the, what was the latest estimate? About 8%? They were saying 8, 8. 8.3, whatever they're trying to pretend it is. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, that's just what they, they're telling you, but obviously it's higher than that, right? Yeah. And I can tell you from, I was looking at a chart, uh, you know, over, I want to say the last hundred years or so. So when interest rates were, or when inflation was at its highest, you saw the fund, the Fed's fund rate anywhere between five to, on average, five to maybe 7%. And then in those high times when, you know, we were had the highest interest rate of almost 18%. It was higher, obviously, right? So that could kind of give you indication that, especially what the Fed has been talking about, they're really going after trying to maintain inflation because if it gets away from it, it could be more trouble, right? So you're going to see a, probably a good push pile over the next 24 months in rates. And again, that's just my opinion. Well, and so, so I went back and looked at it historically too. So in 79, the federal funds rate was 11.2. By 81, it was 20%. Now, I don't think we're going to even hit 10. But the thing is, is in 81, we were looking at 20%. By 85, we were already seeing single digits again. By 86, we were solid singles from there on out. Until now, we've been single digit inflation or single digit, single digit interest rates. Mm -hmm. So if that was 20%, and I don't even think we're going to hit 10, it was a five-year recovery at 20%. So are we looking at a 2.5 year recovery on 10%? Are we going to hit 10%? That's what has me think of that whole 18 to 24, because I just, I really have a hard time believing that we're going to hit that high. Well, I think they're going to be aggressive. That's why. Because you've they're already- they're not. They're doing these baby steps. I think they're going to be aggressive. I think they're going to jump up hundred basis points. Are, are they going to be Volcker aggressive? I don't know. Well, that, again, that, that was a whole runaway runaway train they were trying to trying to bring it rail in. Though. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I'm just I have a hard time with the whole incremental changes. It's like let's increase it. Let's do a quarter of a percent bump here. Let's do a half a percent bump here. I mean, if we're doing all these little changes, all these incremental changes, I feel like we as a we as people, we can adjust to those little changes really quick. And I'm just worried that we're going to adjust to these little changes and it's not going to have the effect that we need it to have because we need it to have a massive effect. We need it to be like, boom, let's stop and not just slow down the economy, but economy, but slow down all of it, slow down the economy, slow down the inflation. Let's do all of it because my, my biggest fear is that we're going to grind the economy to a halt and inflation is still going to be out there. And we're gonna have the but we're gonna have like the worst of both worlds, and we're gonna be stuck in that stagflation, and that sucks. Yeah, stagnant growth, yeah. and everything is high. <laughs> <laughs> no, no doubt, right? Um, and I, and I would think I would say this, you know, from us being in, investors in real estate, um, I would, you know, uh, what's what's the uh, my guy Howard Marks? He talks about history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. He got that from Mark Twain or something like that. So basically, like. I would go back and look historically, right? So not too long ago, what was it, 2000-ish, what, 2003, we were in what, rates of like 7, 7, 6%? Oh, 2003, just to give everybody a little bit of background here, my husband and I bought our first house. We, we put 20% down with a loan. And we were able to finance the other 80%. We financed 100% of our first house. So just let me put that out there for y'all. It's background. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll let y'all do that again. <laughs> no, we, we will <laughs> never be able to do that again. But just to put that out there, because a lot of people are like, oh, by 2008, everything had crashed. No, it's no, it had not. <laughs> but, you know, like I said, I would look back around those times and just, if you read some of those articles back then about what people were talking about, how things were changing, commercial transaction, people were still investing in real estate. Now, I think you'll start to see people get more creative, which I've seen a couple of deals come by where they're asking the seller to put in some of their proceeds as far as equity into the deal to try to make it work. You're probably going to obviously see more loan assumptions, obviously. 
um, because of the rates were a lot lower. Um, and then it's just going to be, you're going to have to wait for the expectation between the, the current market and what sellers were thinking they could get um, and what the buyers want, where they're going to kind of meet in the middle. You're going to have to wait for that to kind of uh, work itself out. Because I think also you got people that are going to be pushing because they know rates are going up. They're going to be pushing to get things so sooner rather than later. So you're probably going to see a flood of, not necessarily a flood, but you're going to see more properties normal than normal trying to get in and get sold with here in the next, what, 90 days or something like that. Well, probably the next six months or so. Well, probably the next 60 to 90, because like we're sitting here looking at it right now because we are actually looking at putting an LOI in this week. And it's even, even our um, loan broker was like, so is the broker telling you just put something in? Because that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a whole lot of brokers just say, hey, offer anything. What are you offering? Because a lot of people have stopped. Yeah. They're not offering anything right now because of the uncertainty, uh, right? Yeah. And I mean, we're taking a risk and we know we're taking a risk and we're looking at it. We're like, okay, what do we think? What, what do we think insurance is going to do? So we were on the phone literally until 4.30 PM today, 4.30 central. And we got on this call at 6 PM central. So an hour and a half before we got on this phone call, we were like, okay, what do we think insurance is going to do? What do we think taxes are going to do? Where do we really feel like interest rates could go? And in this conversation, at one point we were like, and pardon me for my language, we were like, fuck, we are looking at an IRR of like 7%. How are we ever, ever, ever going to get investors with an IRR of 7%? (laughs) We're never going to get investors. And so we're looking at this and we're like, what the heck do we offer to get us a better IRR? And the offers are so far below what we know the whisper is. It's almost embarrassing to offer on an LOI because you know, they're just going to laugh at it. Let them laugh, I say. Because there's only one person. There's only one person you, you're, you're beholden to is yourself and the investors. I know, but it's like, we're, we're going to go ahead and put the LOI in, but I'm just like, I don't feel good about it because like, I know what the whisper is and I know what we're going to offer and it's, it's hard. Cause what I think you don't want to do is, cause like I said, if you, if you don't have enough margin in there, mm-hmm. your work, your, your plan becomes based on perfection. And we know perf- perfection is a moving target, right? So, well, it's, it's most likely not going to happen, right? Yeah. So because it's going to become down to execution, right? Especially if you're doing, again, you're going back to this value add proposition. I can tell you from just from a, a leasing standpoint, what we thought, what my client and landlord thought we, we were going to do as far as cost to build out a space for a credit worthy tenant, what we thought was like maybe $60, $75 per square foot. When I got back all the bids, it was $180, 160 150 and this is people that we're trying to get bids from <laughs> because they got so much work. So, you know, people would have these expectations, hey, I'm be able to turn all these units in 12 months. I think that's really pushed. Even with, with traditional multifamily, your turn rate is, you know, you turn over your, your, your rent roll about 50, 60%. In affordable housing, you can't do that. You'll be out of business if you did that. Well, no, and, and we're looking at, so at this particular property that we're looking at, they took 16 units all the way premium with granite countertop, stainless steel appliances. And we're like, can this area even support that? So we're like, okay, what about if we go quartz? What would be the decrease in pricing? Should we go quartz as opposed to granite? So we've got a contractor coming in tomorrow who's going to take a look at things. And number the first thing he's going to look at is going to say, okay, you got four down units because of a fire. Great. We can look in the walls. Is there aluminum wiring? Because the first thing that we would address is, is there aluminum or copper wiring in the walls? And that's something that people aren't even going to see. But we would go ahead and upgrade it. But that does nothing to what we can get in the rent bump. And and that's why I come back and I say, if all you've got is a rent bump model, you probably need to be sitting it out for a while. 
because you can't just rent bump all the time. You've got to think of other ways to pull in income streams than just that rent bump. So I have a question for you. I apologize if I raised my hand. Oh, I can't see. I can't see. But, um, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even see. No worries. <laughs> speaking on rent bumps, so I know I know a lot of operators are still modeling, like you're saying, they're still modeling for two to three percent increase per annum. Now, with something that I've been noticing is that employment or the medium income in certain areas is not rising as fast as the rents are concerned and with inflation is, is just ridiculous. So how do you account or how would you say investors should look at that when they're underwriting? So, you know, if the income, if, if people are not getting jobs and people are not getting, you know, a bump in their pay to match the inflation and operators are trying to get a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, especially along the the south the the Sun Belt, which is where rents are just skyrocketing astronomically, how does that affect someone's underwriting and how can they, you know, just alter that to make sure that they're not killing their tenant base, which is in turn killing their investors and their deal? Well, I think for for one, I mean you got to have the honest conversation, right? If you depend, and again, let's go back to the strategy. So who is the current tenant base there? Like if you're buying a property and then are you buying it to where you're gonna reposition it to the next tenant base? So if the local AMI is, you know, 50, but you're targeting people that make 70, where are those jobs and where are those people at, right? So it's just a reclassification of those people. So people that are making 70, 80,000 80, 000 a year plus, they can afford that higher increase. But if everybody in that area is around 50 and 60, it's not gonna be the same, especially if they're only individuals or they got you know they got kids and stuff like that. So, so Dominic, real quick, what was the AMI? Area median area median income. Uh, okay. oh, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Because <laughs> I, I use that, I use that, you use that more so in affordable housing because that's how they dictate how much you're going to pay for in, in rent. Mm -hmm. Um. So, you know, from an investment standpoint, you need to figure out who are the people that you're going after, or if you're staying with a certain people, can they actually afford it? And you actually should actually calculate that using what they use as 30%, right? Um, the, a person shouldn't spend more than 30% of their income towards rental. So if you're doing that ahead of time, you kind of get an idea. And then when you're doing your due diligence, you need to actually look at these profiles because one thing that I can tell you, this just comes from, you know, the broker standpoint. If I'm looking to sell, I'm going to try to bump up everything as high as possible. And I, if I have a, a low in occupancy, I'm about to just leave it to anybody mm -hmm. because you're just going to really see that on the service until you actually do your due diligence. And some people who aren't great at that, they're just going to bypass that. So you're going to start looking at these uh, tenant profiles and figuring, okay, who works where and how much are they actually making and reporting, right? Um, so it, it's going to really come down to doing more due diligence, really understanding who your target audience is and can you actually afford to do the bumps that you're talking about? Because another thing also is when people do are, are doing these um, rent comps, where are these rent comps coming from? Some typically, and, and again, this just comes from me, typically you want to look within a mile or less, right? Depending on where you're at, you may have to go further, but typically you want to look at the mile. That's usually your competition. Anything outside of that is for somebody else. They're going to go somewhere else. So if you're pulling comps that's like three, five miles away, that's a totally different market, totally different comp comparable. And you're using that to justify you getting 300 some dollars extra in rent bumps, you may not actually get that. So it just comes back to, again, do more due diligence, especially now with rising interest rates, because things are already hard to pencil. Uh, you got to be sharpening that pencil even more. People went down on rent reserves, on uh, cap reserves. It went from 300 to 250. Now they're at 200 on, you know, class C properties, which, you know, over time have already been needed more, require more maintenance. And then that's only the top line. Bottom line, if you get CapEx, is really about 500 plus whatever you put on top. So it's about 750 or something like that. Yeah. Just no, and, and it's so with inflation, just like what, what y'all been saying is that incomes don't keep pace with inflation. So if inflation is 8% 
and you're looking at 3% COLAs, which is that cost of living adjustment, you've got a 5% loss there, right? And that's just straight. So if we're thinking, okay, we need three times the rent in that base monthly income, right? But above and beyond that, we actually need more than 3% right now because people's incomes aren't keeping up with inflation. So the food bills are increasing. Well, like what I said with my own food bill, my food bill used to be about $750 a month. We're a family of six. We eat a lot. Now we're looking at $1,200. I mean, what kind of an increase is that? Well, that's 33. Is that 50% of an increase? So if we're looking at 33 to 50% increase in just our food, then how does that affect what we would have had available for housing? Because the pie is the same size. The pie doesn't change, but what you can allocate to things changes. So if your rent is continuing to increase, your food allocation is continuing to increase, your fuel allocation is continuing to increase, what do you have left over for housing? You eventually top out. And what are your options? You go delinquent, you just don't pay, or you move. Now, what I've always been told is that people from an A will move to a B. But people from a B will do whatever it takes to not move to a C. So you're going to see families doubling up, which, yeah, it's a lease violation. But at the same time, holy hell, you got to have a heart. Like these are people that are, they're doing the best they can. And you've got to like take a moment to look at what their allocations are. There are so many, there, there's only so many dollars available for housing. And if you have maxed out food and you have maxed out fuel, you've maxed out everywhere else they can be. I'm not saying give people free housing. I am not saying that at all. I'm just saying we've got to have some level of understanding that there are other ways to make money than just continually bumping rents. There's got to be something else that we can do. Or at the end of the day, we're hurting our residents. And I don't think that's what any of us want to do. Pretty soon you'll be offering these big concessions. <laughs> I, I'm not saying concessions, okay? I'm just saying we don't have to push them at four or five, six percent. We can push them at two or three percent and just be understanding of what's going on. I mean, my food bill is going up between 200, 250 and $300 like almost every week. And we can kind of, I mean, I'm not gonna say we can afford it, but we can afford it a whole lot better than some of our residents. And so sometimes I feel like I just need to be thinking of those things before I'm telling my property manager, hey, let's see how far we can bump. So then the question becomes, does this mean that now as investors, we need to re, well, we probably should already been having those conversations anyways, but do we need to find a different pool of investors with the expectations of lower returns from the ones that we already have? But knowing that, because again, like I said, most of these most of these deals now are, are shorter term, right? Everybody's holding now for three years or 24 months or somewhere in between to try to still get some of the similar IRR that's already been ingrained and promised. Uh, but if you notice that the equity multiple has went down too <laughs> because it's a shorter term. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're looking at 1.6, 1.7, whereas before we were looking at 2.1, 2.2. Yeah. So does that mean now we got to have a different conversation? and find new investors or what, what are your thoughts? I, mean, I don't know. I, I have a hard time with this one because I'm not, I'm not that person that's like, I just want to help everybody. Everything's beautiful. It's rainbows and unicorns. I'm not that person. I'm really not. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to just crush people with a housing bill. When I was in college, I paid over half of my income to my apartment and that sucked. And I can't imagine what that would have been like if I had, if I'd had children or if I'd, if I'd had other people like relying on me, cause it was just me. So I could make it work. But what if I'd had other people relying on me? 
So what if I am the breadwinner of a household? What if I am the head of a household and half of my overall income is going to housing? How do I provide for my family? Yeah. But again, like I said, there's going to be people that do take that in consideration. And there's going to be others that's all about the returns and the dollars. What can I do for my investors? Which is fine. You know what I mean? Which is fine. So depending on, again, what your strategy, in my opinion, and uh, going forward is you just have to adjust the court. Underwriting tighter, shorter term holds, or you got to hold it longer and then promise, you know, a little bit lower returns. And then figure out a way how you can either refi out. Because again, the only thing that's still keeping this, this train rolling in, 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 in my opinion, besides the people who have lower cost of capital is the rent growth. If the rent growth wasn't there, you can't make it happen. Well, because rent growth, rent growth is, is, is what's staying highly above the interest rate that allows you to afford it. You still have that spread. And, and I think that residents know that. Residents know that their rent is going to go up. I mean, they, they do. And, and like what Kenneth was saying here, he's like, you know, where else are investors going to park their money? Stocks or bonds? Um, I'm pretty sure those are not doing as well. <laughs> um, but it's, I just feel like the golden era is passing and we're just gonna, it's gonna get a little tougher. I don't know for how long, two, three years, maybe, well, maybe longer. I don't know. I think it's also going to be, you're going to get more of, if they haven't already been, already been from where you guys are at, the gov your local government is going to get more involved because we're at the end of the day, it's, it's supply chain and supply. So if we get enough supply, all this kind of goes away per se, yeah. you know, per se right? So what are they, what is the policy is going to change? You hear everybody talking about the way they're going to try to change zoning because you know zoning is kind of discriminatory. Uh, so you can include certain areas, you can't include certain areas, you can have certain things here. Yeah. How are they going to get adjust that for to increase supply? They're going to have to increase in densities as well on these new developments, which most people don't want what? They don't want apartment developments in the area. They want more housing. But you or can't or do they don't housing. want mobile home communities, they don't want tiny homes, they don't want this, they don't want that. Exactly. But in order to, to make things more affordable, that's the only way you're going to, have to do it, right? You got to be able to put more people in, in, in on, on, more, on less square footage, per se, mm -hmm. uh, to accommodate that. And so. No, yeah. it's, it's, it, 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 I think they're going to, you're going to start to see more people stepping because at, at some point, you know, once enough stories come out, people, rent's going up 400, 500, got three kids. At some point in time, you know, they're going to start getting more involved, even though we're in Texas. At some point in time, that's going to start. Uh, to so a funny story, literally about maybe four months ago, five months ago, a friend of mine gave me a call. She knows that we invest in multifamily. She's like, hey, Angel, do you know who bought XYZ property? I'm like, well, of course I do. It was da, 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 da. And as soon as I said it, I was like, oh, crap. Because her next sentence was, so my mama lives in XYZ property and she's been paying $518 a month and they're fixing to bump her rent to $1,000 a month. And I was like, OMG, I'm like trying to swallow back my words. I'm like, what the heck do I do here? Um, because what happened was this group of people bought this property at a really high price, like 20,000 more a door than what we usually see in this area. And the only way they were going to make that work was by bumping rent substantially. <laughs> um, and so I saw it firsthand. And I think seeing that and just that, that sucker punch of a feeling I felt when my friend was like, they're about to bump my mama's rent from 518 to $1,000 a month. And my mama can't afford that. And just that I wanted to help. And I was like, there was nothing I could do. And so what I wound up telling her was, I said, you know what? So they're basing the rent bump on what's available in the market, what the market will bear. And, you know, a lot of people get involved in this. It's not just willy nilly. Um, so I'm like trying to think of everything I can think of. Right. Um, but it was, it was just a sad situation because her mama had moved to Wichita Falls, we're about 15, 20 minutes away. And I knew that she still had her home back in the old town, but she had moved here to try and find a lower price of living. 
and to be closer to family. And it was just hard. And so even though we may not be firsthand experiencing all of this stuff, there's people out there that are experiencing it. And not everybody that is going delinquent is someone that plans to go delinquent. Um, and, and I'm not saying offer everybody a concession, offer everybody a free ride. I, I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that what other options do we have? And this is why I'm just, I feel like that rent bump model, there's got to be another way. You can't just always be thinking, I'm going to bump rents, I'm going to bump rents, I'm going to bump rents, because there's people out there that are on an incredibly fixed income. And if you bump their rents, you're bumping them out of a home. And I just don't feel like, I don't feel like that's something that I have a right to do. Welcome to affordable housing. Angel, I love that you're kind of advocating for that, those, uh, those people who are on a super fixed income. And it's something that a lot of people don't like to address. And um, how are you, um, I know you said you're on like a board call this morning. How, wh where are you trying to find other streams of income? Are you trying to like get it through parking, uh, through the laundry? Is there any other? So we are. Areas? We're looking at what can we do on a Wi-Fi package? Yeah. What can we do in covered parking? What can we do in reserve parking? What can we do in, oh, you got washer dryer connections. Let's find a company that we can secure those rentals through. And can we profit share with them? Mm-hmm. What else is out there? And that's kind of been the beauty of being in Wichita Falls. Wichita Falls is a very stable economy. So the rent bumps don't happen as easily here. So we are constantly having to think of other ways to generate income. So what else is there out there? So we want to have that base level of income, like base level of housing. Here's what you get. Oh, you want, you want to have Wi-Fi? You want to be able to stream Netflix? That's great. Let us offer you something that's going to be cheaper than what you can get on your own, but it's still an income stream for us. So what else is there out there that we can figure out? Now, the property we're looking at, we're stuck. We're like, okay, we got covered parking. <laughs> we got reserved parking. Maybe we can work something out on laundry. Maybe we can pull something off with Wi-Fi. What the heck else is left? Um, we might yeah, move so some stuff around. Unused space. What's that? So you got to rent out unused land or you have to buy property with extra land. So we, there is extra green space. So we're looking at potentially doing a second raise for some new construction. So let's add some units. For the four down units, I talked to the contractor about possibly bumping up another flight. So let's add some more units on a third flight as opposed to just the two story that was there before. Oh, I like that. So Randy's talking about what about door-to-door -door trash pickup? We don't have a lot of that concierge trash here in Wichita Falls, but if we could, I mean, there could be a need for that. That could be a reason to start a company here in town that does the concierge trash services, the concierge trash services, if I can talk. Um, but those are all ways to get some additional income get those additional income streams from people that can afford those additional income streams as opposed to trying to get it out of people that really can afford it. Hey, but Angel, I, I just got that. Right, first of all, great conversation. I would also think the way you're looking at it or the problems you're incurring are the same ones other potential buyers are going to run into as well. So yeah, I, I would think, you know, you, you instead of trying to rate, um, um, like figure out ways to increase your income, maybe look at the expenses or what purchase price works for you. And can you work something on the financing side? Because, you know, your competition is going to be looking at the same deal and seeing the same income limitations, you know, and lenders too. So, you know, if it's, a, if it's a, you know, if people are, if lenders aren't lending or have a stringent, more stringent lending requirements, you know, people are going to have to bring in more money to the deals. And this is a, this is a syndication deal, I would think like, other syndicators are going to be running into the same problem with, with that. So I would think, you know, yes, you're bumping your head against you know, trying to figure out ways, ways to, for the NOI, but at, try to figure out what price you can, the current structure works because, you know, 
what if you're, what if like your Wi-Fi package, does, you know, no one wants it or something like that? What if your promised additional income streams don't dry up or something like that? I would just try to, you know, start like figure out what purchase price that that, that works out and maybe cut some expenses or, you know, maybe renegotiate gas contracts, do some rubs, try to lower your expenses. But it sounds like the rent is that well, I'm running the same issues in Kansas City, like the rents are not not near market, but they're like close there. So the rent pumps aren't coming. What else can you do or what price does it make sense to do that? Well, what price does it make as is right now? Because that's a, that's what your competition, that's what lenders are gonna be looking at right now too. So I would just, you know, and you're worried about, you know, it's so far below whisper price, you know, maybe the whisper price is something the broker has some, unlearned, is pricing on three months ago, if he, if he starts to get LOI to like significantly lower, you may adjust that or you may have to go back to the seller and say, hey, it's a different market now. So I wouldn't worry about the worst price. I figure out what price makes sense for you right now, submit an LOI like that and, and see what happens. Well, and I mean, we're already there. Um, we're offering over 3 million less than what the whisper is. Um, so that's 25% less than what they were hoping to get. Um, because we, we did what you said, you know, we, we went through and we crunched the numbers and we looked at the numbers and like today on that phone call, I was like, okay, Jason, what's it look like if we offer a flat 10, what's it look like if we offer 9.8, what's it look like? He's like, well, what do you want me to tell you? I'm like, what's the IRR look like? And he was like, well, it sucks <laughs> <laughs> because Jason will crunch numbers for anything. He he's not, when he's crunching numbers, he's, he's not thinking, you know, what's cash on cash? What's RRR? He's just crunching numbers because that's what he does. And so we're telling him, hey, what about this price? Okay, so what do these specific numbers look like? And they suck. And they suck for a lot. And nobody's going to, we're never going to be able to buy at the prices where the numbers look good. Not right now. And so it's like, can we buy right now? and make the numbers work and, and that's kind of the benefit of us being so close we're, we're literally three minutes away we're 3.1 miles from this property that we're looking at so we can make a property that the numbers aren't that great with and we can be right on top of it and ride it until it works good but not everybody gets that same option hey angel i had a question for you being that you're in 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 that particular market, what does development development look like in that market as far as new construction? We don't have development here. <laughs> I mean, I see your smile, honey. We, we don't have nobody building here. <laughs> there might be some downtown development. So what you've got is you've got some people that are getting that EDC, so Economic Development Corporation status. And so they're using some of those, what is it, 4B tax dollars to be able to do some of the, they're, they're able to do some building to move some of these office spaces into rental spaces with the lofts and whatnot, but it's not keeping up with demand. And, and honestly, our population isn't changing that much. So really what you have is a lot of movement from one apartment complex to the next. But in larger metropolitan areas, I would assume people are doing the same things. People are still going to the state and they're asking for that EDC designation and they're going through and they're getting some of those tax dollars. I mean, that's not just a Texas thing, is it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Anybody else know? It's the Economic Development Corporation. It's called the EDC. And you go to your state and you just get that designation. And that gives you part of the like sales tax dollars is an allocation to use. I mean, like we have a good economic opportunity here. Like they're like more concerned, not, not really on the real estate, but more on like bringing businesses here. So like, it's like cheap office space, cheap professional services that they have like that, like they have like incubators and accelerators that they sort of like fund where like a small business has come in and get some office space cheap and stuff like that. That's where I've seen them, but not, not, not really, um like on the on the real estate side all right hold on it's economic development corporation i'm looking it up because i don't want to i don't want to get it wrong um well, while you're doing that let me propose this so 
does this mean now do we need to start as you know beforehand with um the conversions of properties like office and hotels is that something that we need to start look, entertaining more in order to get the type of returns that we were initially had prior wait a second repeat that so looking at looking at conversion properties right so you know like prior to the and, and it got more publicized where people were converting hotels into multifamily, right? Or mm -hmm. converting some type of office into some type of multifamily or mixed use. So do you think based on with rates going up, obviously, spreads already thin as it is, is that becoming more of a, a necessary pivot or more of a preferred, not preferred, but more of a, a thought process that we think about more often than we were beforehand of looking at conversion opportunities. I mean, I think those are definitely options for maybe not just even just single people, but new couples that don't have families yet because they can do that kind of at a, like an efficiency apartment setup. And, and there's plenty of people waiting to start families. I mean, what's the average, what's the average time now? 31 to 33. Um, I mean, back when I did the research on that, that would have been, gosh, 09, 09, 2010. And that was only a couple of years after they had finally really perfected the freezing of eggs. So prior to that, they were trying to freeze eggs, but as they froze eggs, as the ice crystals were forming, it would actually puncture the egg. And so it rendered it useless. And it was, oh goodness, 07, 08 when they really perfected the technology where women could freeze their eggs. And when the ice crystals formed, it didn't puncture the egg. So the egg was still viable. And that allowed for women to put off having children, right? And so that was really where we saw that extension of people putting off starting families. And I think that pushes some of that demand for the efficiency or the one bedroom, correct? Because they, they don't need those larger apartments. They don't need that larger rent space. So, and, and we saw the, the boom of that downtown living too, with that increase of the, you know, increase of the sector and that population size, right? Oh, yeah, yeah that's cyclical cycle too. People, everybody was moving downtown, it was all the rage, and then everybody went back to the suburbia, and then at some point in time, they'll come right back down to downtown even. Yeah, it, it, it flip flops. Absolutely, it does. So I'm so trying to look up this stuff on more, this. No, what was we that? Have two more questions for you guys. Um, I think Lawrence had a question and the Latson posed a question. Lawrence, if you're on, feel free to unmute and ask your question, sir. Well, there's so much of a question. I just want to like, you know what? <clears throat> Come on, rim bumps. Since I've been starting this monthly family, everybody's talking about rent, bump, rent bumps, rent bumps. I think that's what's driving this thing, this whole thing, the monthly family out of, out of space. Because everybody thinks you keep on rent, raising rents. And therefore, and Angel, Angel talks about, you know, and I like that, but people who can't afford it, right? Fix, 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 um, fix income. But even so, people who have, who have a job will be able to afford it shortly. And here in New York City, they have rent control already. So I know what's going to still happen, maybe happen soon is that throughout the United States, tenants people are calling for rent control. So the question I want to ask you though is, as investors, how would you right now underwrite your property? Well, so it kind of comes down to, is that rent control binding or non-binding? So where does the rent control amount fall out on equilibrium? So if the rent control causes a price ceiling, you're gonna wind up with a shortage and you're really gonna wind up with a black market. You're gonna wind up with people that are paying cash to cover that uh, rental gap to be able to stay in their apartment. And nobody's gonna talk about it. Like everybody's gonna know what's going on, but nobody's really gonna talk about it openly. But there will be a known, hey, you got to bump up 40, 50 bucks to your landlord in cash if you want to stay in your apartment. 
because it, it, it causes a shortage. It, it just, rental controls can cause a shortage. And so that's one of the reasons why I just, I personally think that the government stepping in on those things is just not really a good thing because it, it causes more issues than what, what were there before. So now, how, so now we, so you're talking about the rent control. So now when you're writing out, when you write, when you write in the property, uh, the underwriting property you have just right now, looking to put an LRI in, what if all the other factors you've taken to underwrite this property, if the taxes, the before they talk about uh, saying five to 85% of the taxes, the t- times, the, what you're going to, um, the property price. Have you changed that 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 um, equation now? So it's more like one hundred percent of the taxes. So we're a non-disclosure state. Okay, right. Okay. Um. So generally, <laughs> um, people do not pay taxes equivalent to the purchase price of their property. I mean, some people do, some people don't. Um, <laughs> but. You, we currently are underwriting for higher tax payments and tax valuations because we're seeing that right now. Um, so that changes for us. But I just feel like if, like, if you're trying to also underwrite for in, like for rent controls, rent controls are tough because they create a shortage. And when there is a shortage, you're going to see upward pressure in prices, even though it can't really happen. And I am air quoting here. Um, it can't really happen, but it does. Whether that's in under the counter payments or something else that's out there, there is a way that that, that bridge is going to be covered because people only supply more when prices are going up if prices aren't increasing there is not going to be any increase in supply and if you're if you're saying hey we're not going to increase the 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 money you can earn then people have no incentive to supply other than the goodness of their own hearts and there's only so much goodness and i know that's a really bad way to say it but honestly, there's just, there's only so much money out there to be able to, to supply additional housing. So the question now, the, 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 you talk, you talk about before voucher tenants, low income housing. How do you look at low income housing, Dominic? So if we're dealing with like affordable housing and stuff like that, it's more in the operations. Okay. So like, if you took like a tax credit property, obviously the whole goal, if you're going up to the 9%, 9% is basically about 70% equity. Four, the 4% tax credit is about 30% equity. And you're trying to bridge that gap uh, with either very low cost debt on a 4% or some type of bond that's usually issued where your rates are a lot lower, right? To bridge that gap. And then there's other grants and programs that offer additional funds to bridge that gap. So you don't have as much, um, on these particular problems, you don't have as much debt. You have more equity than anything. So you're able to operate it totally different. And with that being said, though, it's a, it's about, we can't have as much turnover as you would in traditional multifamily. Like I said, you'll turn your rent roll over maybe 50%, 60%. You can't do that in, in affordable housing because the, the cost to turn a unit is roughly anywhere between... 75 85 dollars per unit roughly where on the traditional multifamily you could be anywhere from 125 to three something per unit and that's just going to kill your margin that's just a kill your operation so it becomes more of an operation standpoint um putting in more equity into the deal um and then also the expectation of return is totally different so these assets are more of a core or core plus asset meaning that you're probably you know well before such competition, you were probably around the six to eight percent cash on cash. Your IRRs were maybe ten to maybe fifteen, but probably closer to thirteen ish. But because of that, they perform well. It's just basically just year. You're cash flowing these things and you're holding these things seven, ten, fifteen years out. 
and you're not necessarily doing as much CapEx, depending on if you did it at the beginning, if you're buying it, um, or you have to recapitalize it later on. And again, you're getting funds from other sources to recapitalize. Um, and then again, from, uh, from the standpoint of where, you know, you can only pay so much in rent, those people are gonna trickle down to those particular properties if it's income restricted, right? So it's based on how much the area mean of income is and how many family members are actually gonna be in that unit. Uh, and then you have other operators that will do uh, a, mixed, a mixed income use. So that's what I also look at. So you look at a traditional multifamily property and you're gonna basically subsidize the lower cost rents with the higher cost rents with a higher that you're charging on your, the platinum upgrade, right? That's gonna trickle way down to allow you to do a little bit more affordable for those who are making 80% or maybe you can get close to maybe 60%. When you start getting into the 60 to 30 percent um, AMI level of, of tenants, you're going to have to use some type of government um, assistance, whether that's tax credits, whether that's abatements, uh, which now, especially here in Texas, um, for affordable housing, partnering with your housing authority to get that tax abatement to offer those making you know anywhere between 60 and 30 is gaining even more money because. The city of Dallas just here just recently put out a proposal, but I know San Antonio has been doing it because I've been talking with them. Austin has been very active since they know that Austin is very becoming very, very unaffordable. Um, and then Houston has varying degrees of it. But also Houston is a larger area too. So most people just move further and further out. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. And thank you, Dummy, for the, answering the questions. And this has been, this has been, this is a great uh, discussion tonight. It really is. Thank you. But, but I tell you, that's, the government stepping in and covering that gap. So when, when I think about like, what's a price ceiling gonna do? I'm looking at a situation where supply is gonna be way less than what demand is. And when the government steps in and bridges that gap financially, it gets us closer to what the equilibrium cl market clearing rate would be. And so it, it is the Section 8 or whatever other government vouchers there are out there that help bridge that gap to cover what that shortage would be. Now, I don't, want they, I don't know what they have in other places. I've only ever lived in Texas, so that's all I know. But I know that in Texas, Section 8, HUD, whatever it is you're using helps you bridge some of that gap of, of the shortage that would have been there otherwise. So... You know, Lawrence, you, you know more about what's available in New York. I, I have no clue. But I, I would hope that there's some of the same programs there that help bridge some of that that yeah, difference they, between they, what they there is. Yeah, because they got Section 8 here. You got the FEPS program. You got a lot of different programs in, in the city here. Like they like Section 8 is a six nation that boosted love to go to eight. Right? <laughs> That's the real deal. <laughs> so um, you know, it's it's the same thing all over, but it's just that this it's just hard to the you know, phantom when you when you unwrite these some of these properties, it's like where are you get these numbers from, right? To to that you, that you can talk about you know the, the broker. Sorry, Dominic. The broker's like, yeah, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> no, bro, I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, these numbers ain't working, you know. And you know, Mark talked about you talking about five hundred dollars. Mark before talking about raising five hundred dollars. You know, obviously that that's five hundred dollars over a specific period of time, but even a hundred dollars a year. Some people will be like, we're done. I just, I just feel, and I feel, I feel there's going to be a rent revolt. <laughs> That's what I feel. There's going to be a rent revolt. And people will say, you know what? We're not paying rent. Well, because where are people supposed to live? Exactly. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I ride a line, right? I mean, like, yeah, I want to see, I want to see my investors make money. I want to make money. But at the same time, I've taught in high poverty schools. I've seen what it's like to be in high poverty situations. And the last thing I would want to do is kick my old students out of their home. That that's not something I would ever want to do. Mm. I, don't, I don't think it's just, just that, like I said before, I think it's, it's a mixture of low income people, right? Those near the poverty line and also those who are working. So if you're making $8,000 right now after taxes, $90,000, right? <laughs> you're looking like 55 <laughs> maybe yeah so now you got it you, you're doing 30 percent supposedly supposed to be 30 percent for your for your living right 
and everything's going up. So like you said before, you have a family of three or four, you are barely, you are eking by. You are really eking by. I know I, read, I heard something, I read something, somebody just told me the other day where they had the, they're buying food on credit because they can't afford it. And they, they can't go to place. They can't do nothing. It's just, it's just sad. It's sad. I mean, like, no lie. So we went on All Organic for my son. And we were spending, like, I don't know, $150, $200 a week on groceries. Now, I'm trying to keep our groceries under $250 a week. And we haven't really changed what we're getting that much. I, I don't know that we've changed it at all. They're just the, the prices are just going up. And and I realize people could say, well, you could just buy un, you could just buy regular food, not get organic. But like our son has special medical needs. Right. And so we've tried to reduce as many excess chemicals as we have from his diet. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have as many options. Right. We're, I mean, we're already buying the stuff that's like it goes out of date tomorrow. <laughs> Let's get it tomorrow and see how long we can make it last um we're already doing imperfect foods and misfit market i mean i, I don't know what else we can do beyond that uh, well um, I, don't, I don't understand why organic foods cost so much anyway if it's organic you're not using your chemicals if it's grass fed grass is free so why are you charging money because i have because i i have already paid for the chemicals oh i see I'm sorry. i didn't think about that part <laughs> all right paid well, for the chemicals. i tell you what we've discovered is that buying conventional foods outside of the u.s is generally considered organic by U.S. standards. And so we just buy from Mexico or from Chile or from Canada, and it's a little bit cheaper than, say, the fully organic foods, but it's still really pretty organic because it doesn't have... Um, the U.S. allows for way more chemicals in the pesticides than other countries do. Yep. I know, I have another question. Since I got economists here, right? <laughs> He's the big I got I got two economists here, right? I can't speak to Alan Greenspan. Or somebody needs people here. So <laughs> right? no Alan Greenspan or no Mr. Powell. So you said somebody said before, right? That this is called the supply chain. So when do you, when would you think that other other supply chains will get back in order? That we can we can expect lower prices, everything gets back get back to normal. Get back get get gets back to normal. Hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically yeah. speaking, man, that's that's a tough one to answer because I think there's a lot of things that also play into that, right? So you have the cost of the materials, you have the cost of labor. And labor, depending on what you're producing, is just generally costing more. And I don't and I don't, and, and those people that have to come to that workforce to, you know, unless there's another technical technological advancement in that portion of it, I think that's still going to be a key driver that prices will still be high, even though the material may have moderate because you got a little bit more supply in there. Um, but even with that being said, you know, once you kind of make, once you set prices at a certain a certain price, and you can kind of make that money, but your cost went down, what's the incentive to kind of reduce it unless the actual overall demand changes. So at the end of the day, all this boils down to is supply and demand. And then there's some ancillary things in between. Again, in my opinion. Well, and, and you've also got the situation where, so labor supply, you've got this backward bending J curve. So like people are willing, so if you got like supply and demand, people are willing to supply more labor up to a point and then it starts to bend back where it'll take more and more money to get them to work more and more hours. But up to a certain point, they're willing to work for more dollars. I think that with the pandemic, what we saw was before, so supply and demand, before we saw backward bending J curve up here. Now what we're seeing is people have more value on their leisure time. And we're seeing that backward bend occurring somewhere around in here. At least it's lower, right? So people have put more value on their leisure time. So that means that overall, there's less 
labor supply to the market. And that puts upward pressure on the prices of wages. So people expect to be paid more to work more hours. And so we've seen just this overall decrease in the number of supplied labor hours. And that's causing some of the labor shortage as well. So some of the supply chain breakage isn't necessarily breakage, but it's, it's just people realizing that their time is worth more than what they were getting paid before. Now, now is that a huge advocation for let's increase the minimum wage? I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that people are putting a different value on their time. So we're getting, maybe we're getting more European because in Europe, people require more downtime. So are we beginning to hit more of that kind of a stride where we're just requiring more downtime? We're requiring more free time. We're requiring more time with our families, more leisure time overall. I don't know, but I feel like a lot of this was caused by the pandemic being slammed down on top of what was already occurring in our markets, right? I mean, what do you think, Dominique? Yep. I mean, that's going to be a big factor of it. I mean, that job you had me picking in the field for, you know, three, $3 and I can do something else. You're going to pay me a little bit more and I'm still might not return because I, I value my time and doing something else. So to answer that, to go back to your, your question, like how long is that going to be? I mean, to be honest, nobody really knows. Cause even when I was listening to the guy from, um, from target, the CEO of target, when they were doing all the projections, they didn't factor all that in the cost of how much transportation costs, the cost of materials. And then they, they messed up even more so because they did a, a bad prediction on what they thought people were going to be buying. So now they got all these electronics and washers and dryers that people were, you know, buying beforehand, just sitting and that's eating up costs. It costs more to ship it. So their, their profits have, have, have decreased. And then people are switching to different types of brands. So, you know, at some point in time, there's going to be some kind of correction, in my opinion. I don't know exactly when. You hear people saying this year, next year, the year after that. I think as, as investors, we just need to plan as best as we can to try to take the risk out of what we're, we're buying. And if that means offering at a lower price and not getting the property, then so be it. Because at the end of the day, the deal you didn't do is usually the best deal, right? Because you didn't overpay for it. Now you're struggling to try to make things work. And, and I think that's where I'm coming from too. Like I'm coming at it from the point of an economist. I'm like, what's going to continue to thrive right now? Well, generic. <laughs> Why are people going to be paying for name brand when they can buy generic and it's just as good? So does that mean that classy properties are where it's at? Because I'm talking to plenty of people that are like, oh no, class A's. Because what they see is you get a class A property, there's less maintenance. It's brand new. You get a class C, you're going to be paying the same price as what you would pay for a class A, but you've got all those maintenance issues. So in, in residential or in multifamily, are people paying for the class A? Whereas in every other facet of money spending, they're buying generic. Well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. In my mind, I'm thinking class B's, class C's would be where people are focusing, but then I'm, I'm coming up against some of these really big names that are refusing to invest with me in a class B, class C, because they're like, why am I going to invest with you in a class B or class C when I can invest in a class A? I can raise the money for a class A all day long. So why am I going to invest in your class B, class C? But then and it also comes to the, the pricing part of it too, right? So if I'm going to spend the same amount of dollars and put the same amount of equity, I buy as well buy something that's new that gives me a longer runway. Because they already know, if well, some of them do, know that you can only raise rent so much. So then you got to get more oper operationally efficient. So if I'm already in a class A building, which those operate anywhere between, well, depending on how new it is, mm -hmm. but anywhere generally between 43 and 48% OPX is the, is the percentage you need to be around for a class A. If it's brand new and you're just leasing up, you're probably going to be in the 30, 35, which you should factor in 40, 45 at stable, 40, 43 to 48 at stabilization on those properties. Yeah, I, I mean, 
I just remember the phone call that I had with a certain someone and he was like, I'm not going to invest in your class C because it doesn't make financial sense for me. And he explained it to me. And I was like, I mean, clearly I wasn't going to change his mind. So it, it wasn't worth me arguing with him over it. I was like, it's not a class C property. Dang it. It's a class B, but, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't worth me arguing with him. Right. Because he already had his mind set. And his, ex- his investor expectation and criteria is, is slightly different. So that's why I go back when we talked about originally. So does that mean we need to pivot, expand the network to people who have a different expectation or work to convince people that, hey, this, this is the new reality? Which one is more stubborn? I mean, people are resistant to change. So do we try to educate people that are resistant to change or stick with where people are at right now? I don't know. Oh, Mark, what was the other question? Can you say like two questions? Well, that was it. Yeah, um, Regina and BJ Russell, no, all good. <laughs> <laughs> they were asking, um, seeing people calling for rent control in Florida because of the increased percentage, what will that do to existing owners' plans for unlimited increases? <laughs> They're going to be selling. I mean, it, it really comes down to, is it binding or not binding? So if the rent control is below what the equilibrium rent amount would be, then you're going to cause a situation where, so I'm looking at it like this. So like, this is supply, this is demand. And if I'm in a bonding situation, then that means that the rent control is down here. So here's my equilibrium and here's my rent control. Then I'm in a situation where supply here is far under demand, which is here, correct? And that's that situation we were talking about before. If there's no program like Section 8 or HUD or something that's going to bridge that gap, there's going to be a shortage in available housing. And how is that covered? Black market, cash under the table. It's covered somehow, but it has to be covered or the apartment owners have no reason to continue to supply that housing. Or invest in the maintenance of it. Correct. So that's the other issue you run into. Yeah. So I, I've always been, I've always been blown away by how long New York has been able to keep rent controls in place. But then again, I mean, I just read about that whole building that was bought out by its tenants, and there was this group of people that were like, "Rah, rah, man, y'all, you beat the system, you beat the man, you're going to be able to, you know, have your own apartments now." But when it comes time to do any level of maintenance. Where are they going to get that money from? (laughs) Who's doing that? (laughs) Right? Who are they going to get that money from? Are they going to raise it internally? I assume they're doing like some type of like owner's association or something like that. Like a, you know, like a a HOA or something like that. I'm assuming. I mean, I've heard that there's, again, I've only lived in Texas, Texas my whole life. (laughs) I've heard there are, there are groups out there that help with some of those expenses, but I don't know anything about who they are or how you get that funding. I have no clue. But theoretically, (laughs) I know what should be occurring. What was the other question? It was Lawrence's. We answered his. Yeah, I believe that's all the questions unless someone wants to um, you and ask another question. Just, I guess we just make it open discussion, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, that works. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, other than, you know, I guess what we talked about here, what is one thing that is still on your mind in particular? Mark, I'm asking you. Oh, you're asking me. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that that makes everything you said makes perfect sense. And that's that's one of the things that I've been, um, you know, having a lot of discussions with, especially like internally with people that I'm looking to partner with is, okay, you know, we need to account for all of this, you know, as everything is going up, we need to really, like you said, really fine tune the underwriting because, you know, as you guys alluded to, you can't just really focus on, okay, we're going to just ride the rent bump wave or, you know, we're just going to, you know, do X, Y, Z, or we're going to, do a short-term loan and we can't, you know, refi out down the line. So we get stuck in that. And 
I personally believe that we're starting to see that happen now where there's going to be a fire cell eventually for multifamily and we're starting to go downhill in that, in that cycle. And personally, I, you know, speak with my coach and just talking to other institutions, they're just pretty much sitting on their hands right now. Stocks, you know, stocking, um, you know, just pocketing cash. And once that wave start kicking in, you'll see everybody jumping in and buying what people were overpaying for. So then I, I guess that brings up a good conversation then. So being that, is it really going to be a fire sale or is it going to be a correction or is it going to be minimal because of the amount of money that's still available to buy? And will, that pro- and will those properties even be, uh, be brought to the market per se? Good question. So what I've seen personally here is I've seen people buying really classy properties. They have actually, they've upgraded to a point that they literally kick everybody out and continue the upgrade process. And they bring it up to a class B minimally, right? And then they start doing a lease back or lease up. And so I look at that and I'm like, so you took away housing from one subset of people and you brought back housing that that original subset of people can't afford. So where do they go? And where are you getting your new subset? Five miles away. (laughs) So it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. While display while dis- displacing an entire subset of people. Well, if we're having an honest conversation, I mean that was the whole point of the whole program, right? I mean, there's only because again, those properties were already most of those properties were already what 98, 97% occupied, right? And there's only really a couple of ways to get rid of 50% of those people. If if the aggressive thing was to turn all these units in 12 months or you know. Uh, 24 months was you had to change what the the income um, levels in a sense that you had to make three times to it was 2.5 or two times right that was one of them and then when you sent that renewal letter you had the expectation that those people weren't going to renew because it was going to be four hundred dollars more I I hear you it's just it's just hard I mean it's a tough line to walk because I mean, I, I taught in high poverty schools. I know where my students lived. And I mean, it's a weird place for me to be at because as a teacher, I love my kiddos, right? And so I know where they were living and I'm watching those families be displaced. And part of me is like, what the heck? Those kids don't deserve that. And then the other part of me is like, but I want to provide an income to my investors. But who is paying for those returns and it's just a hard place to be in let me ask you this then then could you see it from the other side that is one of the things that's necessary right especially from an older property stuff that needed upgrades that nobody else was going to put the money into and the only way to justify that was to switch to a different uh target audience in order to get those upgrades for a property that can get a little bit more longer one runway and then in 10 years or eight years or so it comes back to a little bit better of a natural occurring affordable product if you look at the other side of it right i think it's just a tough place to be in just period because it's like i believe there's enough of us out there that want to truly help our residents and we want to see our residents get better living conditions i I think that's where most of us come from. But at the same time, it's like, how do we balance providing better living conditions to our residents, but also providing returns to our investors that without our investors, we can't do anything for our residents. So how do you balance that line? There's no perfect answer. Well, there's not. It's just a tough place to be. I'm just proposing. No, I hear you. It's it's a hard place to be, especially when I think of like my kids or my students, because 
you know, they, they didn't make their parents' decisions. And could better decisions have put them in a better place? I don't know. There, there's so much surrounding just the decisions, like decisions made by one group of people versus decisions made by another group of people could be taken totally different. And so it's like, was it strictly a decision-making process or was it being in the wrong place at the wrong time, being the wrong type of person in the wrong place at the wrong time, being the right kind of person in the wrong place at the wrong time? There's so many things that play into it. And I just, I always go back to the student, like it's not their fault, yet they're paying the price for it. And so I think that's the piece of me that's like, man, what can I do to make things better for those kids that don't really have a choice? I mean, yeah, their parents did X, Y, Z, who cares? But why does the child have to pay for it? And what can I do to make things just a little bit better? Just a little bit. You know, I, I'm not saying free rent, concessions to all. That, that's not what I'm saying at all. But what can I do to make life just a little bit easier for those, for those babies, for those kids? Anybody else have anything they want to discuss? It came from teaching middle school. Middle school sucked, by the way. <laughs> In elementary school, kids don't realize they're poor. In high school, they realize they're poor, but they can get a job. In junior high, they know they're poor and there is not squat they can do about it because they're not of legal age to work. And those are the kids that I think about when I think about rent controls. I think about these, these situations that these kids are in. They had no choices. Their only choice is black market operations, whether that's selling Pokemon cards or selling candy bars or selling drugs, whatever it is, that's their option to make their life better at that point in time. And so why do those kids have to continually be punished? There just, there has to be a better option. Done. Well said. Does anyone else have any further questions or Sorry, guys. final thoughts? <laughs> no, no worries. Listen, I feel you. Yeah. Yeah. You're I very feel passionate. Like yep. It just makes yep. me angry. Because it I don't does. Know. And I think you being there for them is a big thing. You being the structure for them, the secure place to come and talk about it is means a lot you know and they like you said they don't know they're poor at that certain age and then working with ages 10 to 18 in my realm of work it's hard it's like i just want to take all these kids home to come to a, a secure place roof over their head you know not worrying about who's coming in and out of the door at night throughout the night i get it and i think you just maybe it is just a new thing is having a little community for these kids to come to after school, just to know that you're there. You know, maybe it's a nonprofit you come up with. I don't know, but no, I feel yeah. No, I'm, I'm just seeing kids that they wouldn't have had to work before that now all of a sudden I'm going to Dairy Queen, I'm going to Sonic, wherever. And my babies that I had that first year I taught here in town that were seventh graders, I'm seeing them in jobs. And I'm like, I'm asking other girls, I'm like, is that so-and-so? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, so-and-so, last name so-and-so? Like, yeah, that's that's him. You mean, you mean go get him so he can come say hi? And I'm like, yeah, go get him. <laughs> but it's like seeing those kids that they came from solid families that they shouldn't have ever had to get jobs. Like there was no reason for those kids to get jobs at 15. Maybe at 17, 18, but at 15, not really. And so part of it is just where we're at in this economic environment. I mean, they're having to help supply dollars to their families. And it's just, it's just sad. I mean, their, their childhoods are being taken from them. So Mark, what's the final thoughts, man? Besides, we gotta take care of the kids. 
take care of the kids. Take care of the kids. Um, Try to take care of your investors. Take care of your investors. Take care of your tenant. Those are that's the lifeline of your business. Mm-hmm. And you yeah, that. and yeah, <laughs> like you said, do your homework. Do your homework before you know mm-hmm. the best deal you can buy is not buying a bad, not buying a deal. Like you said, you know, a lot of people are just willing to overpay and are not thinking long term. And the, the effects of overpaying, and there's no plan because they're just seeing, you know, they're just seeing rest what's in front of them. And as investors, we need to think long term. And like you said, we need to incorporate all of these assets, which is our tenants, our investors, you know, our money as well. And, you know, just not to buy a deal, just to buy a deal. So that is why I brought you guys on today. And I want to thank you both for sharing your wisdom, sharing your knowledge. And I'm sure that, like, listen, I took a page of notes. I'm about to go Google a whole lot of stuff that you guys mentioned. <laughs> I probably went over my head. Now you're going to be at home doing this. <laughs> I was exactly trying to like... Right? I going to be doing all this. Oh, the back with Jay. Work. Back with Jay. <laughs> leave leave no, me alone. So, no, it's fine. Listen, it, this was a very informative and educational mm-hmm. um, meetup. I appreciate you guys um, sharing your knowledge. And I hope, you know, to all the people who are going to rewatch this, or if you have any questions, reach out to Dominic and Angel. They're, that's what they're here for. They're here to, you know, to educate and to empower and to make sure that you don't jump into a bad situation that can blow up in your face down the line. Ask questions. You know, if you don't watch the news, they're, they're, they're your newscasters. LinkedIn is your best friend. Reach out, to, <laughs> reach out to them. So, guys, thank you so much. And before we close, to so all those who will be in the Chicago area, July 13 and 14th, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, July 13 and 14th, the GOP Network will be having their their annual conference. You going? You can. I'm not sure if I'll be there, but um, you can definitely get your tickets now, or you can if you're part of GOP Network, you go to gobnetwork.com forward slash uh, GOB underscore conference underscore 2022 to get your tickets. Uh, right now, I believe they're having a sale or something like that, but I will definitely drop the link uh, in the chats for you guys if you're interested. And I will keep your prize that they're doing a hybrid model, but um, it's a great way to network and connect with other like minded investors and to, to build your Rolodex for when this recession starts coming in. And you guys can. <laughs> Go and buy. It's just not recorded assets. yet. <laughs> yeah, it, it, listen, it's not recorded. We're, you know, we're just getting a, a part of the story. But this is what why we are savvy investors. We like to look beyond the norm and look beyond what they're telling us. And you know, we're just preparing ourselves. So that'll be all, guys. Thank you so much for everyone for coming on. Um, I guess I will see you guys in four weeks for our next meetup. Have a great night, everyone. You guys have a good night. Thank you, sir. Great meetup. Thank you, Dominic and Angel. (laughs) Peace. Peace out.